BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of his word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be his disciples and after his death and resurrection those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now after 2,000 years Beth Goyim Messianic congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. Let's go get a blessing. Turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 19, Bamidbar 19. This is message P089, P089, Parash 39. It is called Chuchat, Chuchat, Chuchat. It means regulations, regulations. You know, so many people hate the regulations of the Lord. I personally love them because you can count on them. I love the way he set things up. I think they're perfect. Okay, so we're going to try to go through uh, a good, a fair amount of this, but we'll take it for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. Bamidbar 19, verses 1 through 5. Adonai said to Moshe and Aaron, This is a regulation from the Torah which Adonai has com commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a young red female cow without fault or defect, and which has never borne a yoke. You are to give it to Eleazar the Cohen. It is to be brought outside the camp and slaughtered in front of him. Eleazar the Cohen is to take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle the blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. The heifer is to be burned to ashes before his eyes, its skin, meat, blood, and dung, to be burned to ashes. Amen? So first of all, you have Eleazar is going to watch the animal be uh, slaughtered. He is personally not going to do it because the, the Kohen, Hagadol, is not to t uh, touch anything dead. Okay? So killing it, would then you'd be touching it. Okay? So here, the other part of this is that he's going to watch it be done, but it's a sin offering. The sin offering, this, this red heifer is being brought outside the camp for the sin offering to be burnt up. See, this is what we need to do with our sin. We need to realize our sin and bring it outside of our camp, outside of our home. So if somebody is doing certain things they, that are not proper, you want to bring that outside the camp. You don't want to keep allowing sin inside the camp. So here the Kohen Haggadol is going to take this animal. They're going to burn it up in totality. Everything that is going on with the animal, he's going to take it outside and burn it up completely. Okay? So the other part about this, it is a, it is a red heifer. It is not a regular cow. So there's going to be different uh, things in this animal that is going to be used for the Lord's purposes. You're going to put the ashes of the red heifer into the, um, the water for a purification. And remember the water of purification, those ashes of the red heifer were there from when Yeshua did his very first miracle at the wedding of Cana. These ashes of the red heifer. So everything in totality is going to be burned up before the Kohen Haggadol's eyes. Now who is our Kohen Haggadol? Yeshua is our Kohen Haggadol, right? Are you sure? Are you positive? He's, he's our Kohen Haggadol. So here, all of our sin is brought outside the camp, outside the camp, and Yeshua, the Kohen Haggadol, watches it get burned up so that it, you will be pure, okay, away from those sins, okay? Now looking at verse 6, Numbers, Bamidbar 19, verse 6, 
The Cohen is to take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet yarn, and throw them into throw them onto the heifer as it's being burnt up. Amen. Now, a lot of times you're like, why are we doing this? What's its purpose? You know, why is everybody smelling this barbecue? You know, now, I don't know if you guys in the Philippines have barbecues, but one of the big things in America, especially now, especially now, that it's summer. One of the best things that we have, you could you open up your windows and all of a sudden, around dinner time, what do you smell? Somebody's got a barbecue going, and it smells so good. Now, why would Jehovah have us take some cedar wood, some hyssop, and some scarlet yarn to put on top of this red heifer that's being burnt up? Many of the things in the Bible, especially in the Torah, they're medicine. Like my wife has an infection uh, in her body at the moment. So what she's been do doing is we grew hyssop from a bush in our backyard, which is basically a weed. And she's been drinking that and some other roots. And she's been drinking this tea to make this infection go away. Now this is being burnt up, so you're going to be breathing it in. Now to really understand what's going on here, turn back in your Bibles to Viacra 14, Leviticus 14, we're going to look at verse 1 through 7. Viacra 14, verse 1 through 7. Viacra, Leviticus 14, verses 1 through 7. To understand what's going on here, there is medicine that is being going up through the air, and as people breathe in, if you've ever uh, seen somebody that has asthma, and they have a mask on, and they're, they're breathing in the nebulizer. They're breathing in the medicine. Now let's take a look at this. And I said to Moshe, this is a law concerning the person afflicted with tisserat. On the day of his purification, he is to be brought to the, he is to be brought to the Kohen. And the Kohen is to go outside the camp and examine him there. If he sees that the tisserat sores have been healed in the afflicted person, then the Kohen will order that two living, clean birds be taken for the one to be purified along with the cedarwood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop leaves. The Kohen is to order one of the birds slaughtered in a clay pot over running water. As for the live bird, he, take, he is to take it with the cedarwood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop, and dip them in the living, and the living bird in the blood of the bird slaughtered over running water, and sprinkle the person to be purified from the altar, from, purified from the tisserat seven times, Next, he is to set the live bird free in an open field. Okay? Now, you look at that and you go, why? So why are we looking at this? Well, the cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. These are three substances that were materials used for purification. Okay? The cedar, or a juniper, is it's like a, it takes away uh, infection. Okay? The scarlet has a dye, and this comes from an animal that makes a dye that is also a medicine. And then you got the hyssop, which is good for 99 different diseases. So you're mixing these three chemical compounds that the Lord knows what purpose they are. Now, they didn't have microscopes back then, but the Lord mixes these three things together for the sin offering. Now, that's being burnt up as we go back to Numbers 19, verse 6. That's being burnt up, and then those ashes of all that stuff being burnt up is being burnt up in total, and then the ashes are going to be used in the water of purification, a medicine to take away the sin. Okay? Now let's go back to Numbers chapter 19, please. Bamidbar 19, verse 6 through 8. Numbers 19, verse 6 through 8 now. The Kohen is to take the cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet yarn, throw them, into the, throw them onto the heifer as it is burn, burning up. Then the Kohen is to wash his clothes and himself in water, after which he may re-enter the camp. But the Kohen will remain unclean until evening. The person who burned up the heifer is to wash his clothes and himself in water, 
but he will remain unclean until evening. Okay, so let's take a look at the scene. Now, the ashes of the red heifer are, and the cow is first being brought outside the camp. So the sin offering is being brought outside the camp. The sin offering is then being burnt up, but now the person, the person who is doing the offering, the person who's doing the offering is also being washed up, okay? The person who's doing the offering outside the camp is being, he is now washing himself clean, okay? And all this is taking place outside the camp. But why outside the camp? Now turn to Matthew 3, Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. Then Yeshua came from the Galal. I'll wait a second till you have a chance to find that. Matthew 3, verse 13 through 17. Then Yeshua came from the Galal to the Yarden to be immersed by Yochanan. But Yochanan tried to stop him. You are coming to me. I ought to be immersed by you. However, Yeshua answered him, Let it be this way now because we should do everything righteousness requires. And Yochanan led him. As soon as Yeshua had been immersed, he came up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened. He saw the Spirit of God coming down upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. Amen. Let's look back at verse 15. Look back at verse 15. However, Yeshua answered him, let it be this way now because we should do everything righteousness requires. Then Yochanan led him. Okay, so let's first look at who is Yochanan. Yochanan was who? He was a Kohen, okay? He's also a Nazarite. He was put aside from the time of his birth, okay? He is out where? He's not in the city because the Yarden River is not inside Jerusalem proper, okay? He's outside the city. Yeshua comes to him, and you think he had a Speedo on? Yeah, Yeshua had a Speedo on, that's right. Or he had those jams on. He had a long bathing suit, right? You think so? He had a big bathing suit, right? And he only had, the, you know, his shirt on. No, he went in. They didn't have bathing suits back then, nor did they have pants or anything. So what it did, he went into the yard and river and basically washed his clothes. He's a sin offering. He's a sin offering. So he then goes outside the city just as righteousness requires. This is why Yeshua said this to Yochanan, because here in Bimid Bar 19, you had to take the sin offering outside the city. Okay? Yeshua is our sin offering. He went outside the city the other person, the Kohen, is to wash his clothes, as we saw in Bamidbar 19, verse 7, is to wash his clothes. And here, Yochanan and Yeshua are in the Yarden River. They're not skinny dipping. They're not all natural. Okay? This isn't San Francisco. Okay? They're out there in their clothes. Okay? So there you see that why Yeshua said, All righteousness requires. It's a very important phrase that most people miss why Yeshua said it. So here it is. The reason he said it is because he had to go out of the city and do this clothing thing. But it couldn't just be him. It had to be a Kohen, and Yochanan is a Kohen. Now let's turn back to Bamidbar 19. Bamidbar 19, let's now look at verse 9 and 10. Bamidbar 19 Verse 9 and 10. But Midbar 19, verse 9 and 10. A man who is clean is to collect the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place. They are to be kept from the community of the people of Israel to prepare water for purification for sin. 
the one who collected the ashes of the heifer is to wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. For the people of Israel and for the foreigners staying with them, this will be a permanent regulation. Amen? So here, this person is outside the city. They're unclean until evening. What if it was like 10 minutes before evening? You know, but they're unclean until evening. Okay, this is a permanent regulation to be done through all generations. But the key here that we're looking at right now is the sin is unclean until evening. Unclean until evening. Now turn to John 19. John 19. We're going to look at verse 30 through 33. John 19, verse 30 through 33. Now we're looking at the unclean until evening. It's a very important understanding, and we see something in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, that fulfills this one being unclean until evening. Once the evening comes, then he is clean. John 19, verse 30 through 33. After Yeshua had taken the wine, he said, It is accomplished. And letting his head droop, he delivered up his spirit. It was preparation day, and the Judeans did not want the bodies to remain on the stake of the cross on Shabbat. Since it was especially important Shabbat, so they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies removed. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been put on the cross, the stake beside Yeshua, then the legs of the other one. But when they got to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Amen? When was Yeshua on the cross? What time to what time? Nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. He was on there for six hours. So here, I want you to go back to verse 30. This is tying together with what we read in Numbers. Verse 30, after Yeshua had taken the one, he said, It is accomplished. And letting his head droop, he delivered up his spirit. So he was unclean until evening. So Yeshua said, It is accomplished because he became the sin offering. Where was he on the cross? Outside the city. The person is unclean until evening. So when Yeshua then said it was accomplished, he completed what it was for the sin offering. And then what did they do with his body before evening came? They put him in the tomb. This is why he died at three to give them enough time to prepare his body with some of the stuff to wrap it in the linen cloth to get Pilate to release his body. He was already dead. But he was in the grave before evening came, fulfilling all the righteousness that we saw in Numbers 19. He had to be unclean outside the city until evening. So Yeshua accomplished that, and then once evening came, sin had been forgiven. Now go back to Numbers 19. Numbers 19. We're going to now look at verse 11 through 13. Numbers 19, verse 11 through 13. Numbers 19, verse 11 through 13. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, will be unclean for seven days. He must purify himself with these ashes on the third and seventh days. Then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself the third and seventh days, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches a corpse will, no matter whose dead body it is, does not purify himself, has defiled the tabernacle of Adonai. That person will be cut off from Israel because the water of pur for purification was not sprinkled on him. He will be unclean. His uncleanliness is still on him. Amen? So here we're looking at this very weird thing, third and seventh days. 
Why, Lord, do you want me to sprinkle water on myself, the, 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 the water of the purification, which has the ashes of the red heifer, the scarlet yarn, the hyssop? Okay, why do you want this on me on the third and seventh day? Well, seven we know is perfection. So you're outside the camp for one week, seven days. But why the third day? Why the third day? You know? Do you know? Have any idea? You don't know. You don't know. I'm telling you that you don't know. But you're going to find out. Turn to Exodus 19. 19, verse 10 and 11. We're going to take a look at three scriptures about the third day. Shemot 19. We're going to get a picture of something for the third day. So when you're unsure of it, you do a word study and you look at the diamond so you can see, okay, third day, third day, third day. Well, why am I doing the third day? What's, what's the deal with the third day? Exodus 19, verse 10 and 11. It says, So Adonai said to Moshe, Go to the people today and tomorrow, separate them for me by having them washed their clothing and prepare for the third day. But on the third day, day, Adonai will come down from Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. Amen. So first we're having the third day. The first look is that it's a separation. Separation for God, cleaning your clothes, getting away all this, this dirt and things like that, cleaning up yourself, but then the Lord is going to give you his word on the third day. So that's one, okay, separation. Now, let's take it a little further. Go to Leviticus 7, Viacra 7, verse 17 and 18. Viacra 7, verse 17 and 18. Let's take a look at the second third day. Leviticus 7, verse 17 and 18. Leviticus 7, verse 17 and 18. Leviticus 7, verse 17 and 18. However, what remains of the meat of the sacrifice on the third day is to be burned up completely. If any of the meat of the sacrifice of his peace offering is eaten on the third day, the sacrifice will neither be accepted nor credited to the person offering it. Rather, it will have become disgusting, a disgusting thing, and whoever eats it will bear the consequences of his wrongdoing. So here, let's take a look at the second one. So here the Lord is saying in the Numbers 19, you want to purify in the third and seventh day. We've looked at the seven. Now we have the third day, wash your clothes, separate yourself for the Lord. Then your offering on this third day. If you eat that offering that has been sitting around for three days, it's going to have disease in it because you didn't have refrigeration and it's been sitting out. And the Lord said it's not going to be credited to you. Actually, it's going to be going against you. So with the sickness in Numbers 19, you have the second part of Offering to God. So the third and seventh day, the third day you're having this offering to God because here you want the water of purification with the ashes of the red heifer, the sin offering that's supposed to be in it, the chemical reaction, and the medicine you're supposed to do third and seventh day. Get the law together. Then you also have this offering for the Lord. Now let's go a little further. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4. It says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 says, for among the first things I passed on to you was that was what I also received, namely this. The Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the Tanakh, what the Tanakh says. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with what the Tanakh says. 
Amen? So let's put the three parts of the threes together. Get the law. Separate yourself. Wash your clothing. Don't eat things that are not to the Lord anymore. It'll make you sick. So then Yeshua is raised on the third day. Here, going back to Numbers 19, you're being sprinkled clean. Why? Because of the word. Why? Because you're separated. Because you're in sin. Why? You're in sin because you need Yeshua to wash away your sins on that third day. The third and seventh day. Why? Then you get to the seventh day, God Shabbat, then you rest in the Lord. Okay? Now let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 2 through 6. We're going to look at now in Numbers 20, Moshe's mess up. Numbers chapter 20, verse 2 through 6. Numbers chapter 20, verse 2 through 6. Because the community had no water, they assembled themselves against Moshe. Why did you bring Adonai's community into the desert? To die, we and our livestock. Why did you make us leave Egypt? To bring in us into this terrible place without seed, figs, grapevines, pomegranates, or even water to drink. Moshe and Aaron left the assembly, went to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and fell on their faces, and the glory of Adonai appeared to them. Amen? Aaron and Moses, these guys, you know, they're putting up with a lot of stuff from people. You know, a lot of times when people leave the bondage of sin, they forget how bad it was and why they wanted to leave in the first place. If Egypt was so great, why did you want to leave? Why were you crying out to God? So here they're now in the desert. They're complaining to Moses, we got no water to drink. There's no bodegas to go to. There's no chicken. There's no rice. There's nothing. To... So we're just walking. We're walking. We're a bunch of wandering Jews. You know, in Egypt, we had seed, we had figs, we had grapevines, pomegranates, and now there's nothing to eat. So Moses and Aaron, they go before the Lord. Okay? So when people are bothering you, this is something for us to remember. And they're, they're bugging you, and they're complaining, and they're complaining, and they're complaining. What do you do? You fall on your face, and you say, <laughs> what? <laughs> no. You say to them, nothing, and you bring it to the Lord when you can't do anything about it. If everything is out of your control, you got to bring it to the Lord. So Moshe and Aaron go before the Lord. They're old, so they fell over. No, they, they fall on their faces before the Lord in prostration. Now we look at verse 7 and 8. Adonai said to Moshe, take the staff, assemble the community, you and Aaron, your brother, and before their eyes, tell the rock to produce its water. You will bring them water out of the rock and thus enable the community and their livestock to drink. Now, in verse 8 there it says, tell the rock to produce its water. The word tell there or speak is the word debar. To speak, declare, command, Promise, warn, threaten, or sing. Okay? So here, Moshe is singing, is told to the Lord to sing to the rock. Okay? He is told to speak to the rock. Now this is the only time Jehovah says, speak to the rock. Okay? Now, maybe Moses was getting a little old. He needed a hearing aid. You know, he was a little tired. There's all these people complaining. But the Lord, you know, the Lord in his wisdom, and I'm not going to question the Lord, but I'm like, every time I read this, I'm like, man, Lord, we were complaining. We were whining. My feet are tired. We're moving around. We're going from place to place. We don't know where we're going. Anybody else ever complain to the Lord with silly stuff? And we have the whole Bible to let us know what the end of the story is. 
The Bible hadn't been written yet. So here, these people are complaining. The Lord says to Moses, Mo Moshe, speak to the rock. And also the word there says, means to sing. La, 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 la. Water come out. La, la. No, but here, the Lord says, speak. Now we look at verse 9 through 11. Moshe took the staff from the presence of Adonai, and he, as he had ordered him. But after Moshe and Aaron had assembled the community in front of the rock, he said to them, Listen here, you rebels. Are we supposed to bring you water from the rock? Then Moshe raised his hand and hit the rock twice with his staff. Water flowed out of the, in abundance, and the community and their livestock drank. Amen? Now, Moses didn't listen to the Lord. He lost his cool. He got angry. And you see, he gets angry because he says to them, Listen here, you rebels. I think that's pretty tame. <laughs> you know, I would have said a little something else, but you know, Moses is better than I am. Maybe once I get to be like 87 like Moses or 83 or whatever, I'll be a little bit more mellow. <laughs> Peanut gallery over there. Peanut gallery over there. Teenagers, I'll tell you, we have teenagers here. Okay? So Moses calls them rebels. You can see that he's angry. Okay? But this should go, remember, I think it was last week that we were doing Korak. And the whole group came, you know, and wanted to take Moses and Aaron out and take over the whole community. This is something for those people who think they want to be in leadership. Because remember, too much is given, much is required. Too much is given, much is required. Moses messed up once here. Once. The Lord said to speak to the rock. He messes up. He's angry. He's in a whatever type of mood. He messes up. He strikes the rock twice. Not once, but twice. You can tell he's angry. But from this, in, uh, this incident, Moshe does not get to go in the natural into the promised land. So anybody thinking that they want to be a rabbi or a pastor or a leader of a congregation, you better read this and read it good because the Lord is not going to show you grace. Okay? Because too much is given, much is required. I know there's this ridiculous teaching going on out there with this hyper grace and whatever this silliness is. My Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes and nor does his word. If you want to be in leadership and we are called to be a holy priesthood, be holy for I am holy, says Yeshua. Moses just didn't listen once and he doesn't get to go to the promised land. A lot of people say, well, Messiah came. No. Get that demonic understanding out of your mind. Messiah came to wash away your sins, but he says, sin no more. Stop doing it. Moshe smacked the rock, not once, but twice. Twice. Now, why did he strike it twice? Turn to Mark chapter 14, please. Mark chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 27 through 31. Mark chapter 14, verse 27 through 31. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 27 through 31. Yeshua said to them, You will all lose faith in me. For the Tanakh says, I will strike the shepherd dead, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you into the Galal. Kephas said to him, Even if everyone loses faith in you, I won't. Yeshua replied, Yes, I tell you, that this very night, before the rooster crows twice, 
you will disown me three times. But Kepha kept insisting, even if I must die with you, I will never disown you. And they all said the same thing. Look back at verse 30. Yeshua replied, yes, I tell you that this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. Amen? How many times does Moshe strike the rock? Twice. The first time, you can see the Lord maybe letting it go. But here, with the reference of Kepha, before the rooster crows twice, not once, because you disown him once and you're like, you hear that rooster? Pay attention. Listen. Because the Lord said, speak to the rocks. Speak to bar. So here, Yeshua is saying to Kepha, before the rooster crows twice, ah, oh, I don't know the man. That should set your ears. Listen carefully. Don't make the mistake. Don't strike it that twice. Stop where you are. Just like the woman that was caught in adultery. They couldn't stone her. Why? Because the man wasn't there. But what did Yeshua say? Hey, it's okay. They, they were breaking the law. That, you know, Go ahead, fornicate. It's, it's awesome. No. He said, go sin no more. So here, you don't want to go for the second time. Now let's go back to Numbers. Numbers. Chapter 20. Let's look at verse 12. Numbers 20, verse 12. We'll do two more parts. But Adonai said to Moshe and Aaron, because you did not trust in me, so as to cause me to be regarded as holy by the people of Israel, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. Amen? So Moshe was told by Jehovah, now you don't get to go in. So if you think that you want to be in leadership, think very long and very hard about the role you're going to play because when you sin, your sin is not your own. It affects everyone around you, even in the congregation. If you fail, a lot of people are looking to you for an example. But Moshe spoke. I bring you water. You rebels, I bring you water. So this ties together with your vows. When you open your mouth and that vow. Now let's go to one last final part. Let's turn to, uh, for this parash, let's just turn to Numbers chapter 21. And we're going to look at verse 5 and 6. Numbers chapter 21, verse 5 and 6. Actually, let's uh, go to 7 through 9. I'd rather do that one first than that tonight. Numbers chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. The people came to Moshe and said, We sinned by speaking against Adonai and against you. Pray to Adonai that he rid us of these snakes. Moshe prayed for the people. And Adonai answered Moshe, Make a poisonous snake and put it on a pole. When anyone who has been bitten sees it, he will live. Moshe made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. If a, sna if a snake had bitten someone, then... When he looked toward the bronze snake, he stayed alive. Amen? I love using this one when I'm witnessing to Jewish people. So, you can't believe in Messiah, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Here in Numbers chapter 21, somebody got bit by a poisonous snake. Just by looking at a snake on a cross thing, you're going to get healed. And you can't believe in Messiah? You see how strange that is? You got to look at the snake. What does a snake represent? What did the Lord change Hasatan into? A gopher. Yes, a gopher. An alligator. No. A porpoise. 
Or, 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 what did he change Satan into? A dolphin? No. A giraffe? No. An elephant? A hippo? No. A monkey? No. Rabbit? No. Oh, a snake. A snake represents sin. So you put the snake on the stick. People are look at that been bitten by the snake, bitten by sin, by looking at it and trusting God would heal you. Hmm. Sounds a little bit like the New Testament. Oh, let's turn to it. Turn to John 3 and then we'll wrap up. John 3, verse 14 through 17. John, Yochanan 3, verse 14 through 17. Yogan on tree, Yogan on three, verse 14 through 17. Just as Moshe lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life instead of being utterly destroyed. For God did not send the Son into the world but world to judge the world, but rather so that the, through him the world might be saved. Look at 14. You might want to underline it and put a note next to it. Just as Moshe lifted up the serpent as a desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So by looking at the cross and believing and trusting, you will be healed from your sins? Huh? Sounds a little bit like what we read in Numbers 21, verse 7 through 9. I got to look at the snake on the staff. What was Yeshua on? He was on a stick with a cross, right? What did Moses' staff look like? What, you know, what was it? You know, he had to put a snake on the thing. And, and by looking at it, those that had been bit by the sin, because they had sinned against God and Moshe and Aaron, they looked at it, trusted in God, and they were healed. Oh, sounds just like what Yeshua was talking about in John 3. Looking at the one who became sin for us. Well, that's all the time we have now for this particular Shabbat. It has been wonderful being with you. Shabbat Shalom. Amen and amen. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to the Remnants Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. And click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. 
and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles, living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture. Truly, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend a day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially news from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our king's word. We close this Shabbat together with a reading of the new week's parasha. That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, Many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and biblical holy day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, YESHUA. Shalom.